First Thessalonians chapter four, this is August 5th, and this is an exciting chapter, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. It uh, really addresses what's important. I mean, when, when you're, as a Christian, you ever have somebody ask, you know, what, what is, what's the main thing? What is it that we should be doing? And everybody has a different idea about this. So Paul's kind of saying, what's important? And, uh, and he exhorts the, this young church here, and he urges them in, in the Lord. And he says that you should abound more and more. Uh, in this love and you ought to walk and to please God. So he's, he's directing them to say, hey, I want you to look at your life and, and this testimony and your witness because people are watching you. And, uh, and then he kind of caps it off by saying in verse two, you know what commandments we gave you through Lord Jesus. It's something to think that these were the connectors between Jesus and these new believers and they had been witnesses of Jesus. So they're sharing fresh the uh, the commands of Jesus and into their life, and they point them to the importance of a life of holiness, a life of separation. That's why he says in verse three, "For this is the will of God, um, your sanctification." A sanctification is one who's set apart for holy purposes. They're set apart, uh, different from the world, not to be touched nor contaminated by the words because you're not the world you're gods and and so he goes into several things hey don't be like the gentiles who don't know god you know god and uh, because you do know god through jesus it's going to make a difference in your conduct it's going to make a difference in the way you live we still even though we're saved have to be there has to be an act of the will of which we determine to partner with god I'm going to obey. I'm going to die to the fleshly instincts and give my life wholly to the Lord. And so, um, and he says, don't, not, not with passions of lust. No, give your life, life to God. And, and he says, beware, don't let anybody take advantage of you. Don't, uh, don't be, allow someone to defraud you, to seduce you. Uh, this is very, it almost is an alert. This is a warning of the deceptive, the deceitfulness of sin and the, and the dark strategy of, of hell. And so uh, he says, God didn't call us to uncleanness, but to holiness, to be wholly devoted to God. So he then speaks about the conduct of your life and how you ought to be living your life, uh, how, how, what our life should look like. And he speaks about this example. He says, but concerning brotherly love, um, that you are taught by God to love one another. This is the credentials, really, of your life and my life. You'll, Jesus said, they'll know that you're my disciples by your love one for another. So we have to be abounding in this love of God as God so loved the world and he loved you and I. That We have to live in the overflow of that love in, in our uh, treatment and our concern for other people. And then he gives a few indications here in verse 11. He says, uh, that you and I ought to spy, aspire to live a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your own hands, uh, and, uh, and that you may walk in a way properly towards those who are outside. Uh, and so it's a whole aspect of reputation, but uh, you know, a quiet life, don't, that, 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 there's a different spirit, there's a different, there's a different nature in us. And, and I think this is what Paul's trying to identify here is that our life ought to be distinctly different and that we are an example to those who are watching. Well, then he moves into one of the most powerful and profound verses in the Bible that gives us hope of our future. Sometimes we live in the world with all the chaos, with all of the demons, and we lose sight of the fact that this world's not our home. We're just passing through. And he paints a picture of the coming of Jesus, that this Christ is going to return. And uh, Paul says here, notice what he says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. I don't want you to be in the dark on this concerning those who've fallen asleep or those who've died. And, and he's, he's helping them to understand, don't, you don't have the same as the world uh, who has no hope. Um, you, you don't have the sorrow as those of the world who do not understand this principle, this revelation. He says, if we believe, verse 14, that Jesus died and rose again, and I ask you that question, do you believe that Jesus died? 
Do you believe that he rose again? Do you believe the death of Jesus on the cross, his sinless death, that you and, and his resurrection? Do you believe in that? And I think that all of us would affirm, yes, we do believe. He said, if you believe Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus or those who've died in Christ. And I think that's why this great emphasis upon clinging and hanging on and don't back down and don't give up and live a sanctified separated life because there's hope we are we're 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 if we die in jesus there is a hope here what's that, what's that hope you'll find it in the next verse there we who are alive and remain until the coming of jesus will not precede those who are asleep so in other words he's saying that uh, the dead in christ the bible says are going to rise first and so the graves are going to go open up. Can you imagine what's going to happen here? Now, we don't understand all the how this is going to fit together, but we do know that when you die, Paul said, absent from the body, present with the Lord. So I'm convinced that those who die are immediately translated to heaven and there's an intermediate state. I, I don't know what this body is that we'll have, but I don't question that that we'll recognize one another, but it's still not the glorified body. That's what this is speaking about here, in which when Jesus returns, the graves are going to open, the dead are going to rise, and, and there's going to be a reuniting of our spirit bodies with our fleshly bodies here that is there's going to be what jesus had the resurrection in which uh it's going to, there's going to be a glorified body and and this we don't understand but it's going the graves are going to open look it says for the lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout there's going to be the announcement of christ from heaven and the voice of an archangel is going to be a shaking voice nobody's going to miss this one with the trumpet of God, it's going to rattle the world, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Graves are going to open. Think of it: uh, millions, billions of graves are going to open, and uh, and and all this dust and molecules are going to come up and be reunited with this uh, heavenly body. And it's it's going to, this glorified, this, this glorious experience. And it says, "Then we who are alive and remain." That is, if we're here when Jesus returns, the graves are going to open. We're going to see it. In a split, sec a split second it's going to happen and then it says we who remain our life are going to be caught up together with them we're going to be translated as we're flying through the sky even as elijah you know was translated you and i are going to we're going to we're going to be changed as we're going through the air and it's going to be forever eternal we're going to be with the lord forever and what does the bible say we're not to dread that day we're not to worry about all the details of the judgment and the tribulation period no it says therefore comfort one another with these words i don't know about you i look forward to the coming of jesus now i don't know if i'm going to go by the way of the grave or i'm going to fly through the sky but one thing i know is that i'm ready i believe as the bible says here that Jesus died and that Jesus rose again. And because of that, I am, I am made a fit subject for the return of Christ. And I know that I, there is no good in me. There's no good in you. It's only in Christ. But when Jesus returns, I believe the dead are going to rise and then I'm going to join them. And it's going to be the greatest moment in all of eternity as we assemble together in the great place that God has prepared for us, the paradise of God. Well, today, you know, the Bible says comfort one another, these words. I want to comfort you. If you're a child of God, if you know that your sins are forgiven, you know that you're his, then you can look forward with expectancy for the return of Christ. If you're not sure that you're a Christian today, I, you know, it's so simple to do. That the Bible says we confess with our uh, mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus rose from the dead. If you and I will just simply make a, convoy, a, a lip confession and believe in our heart in a split second, we are saved and we can be ready for the return of Christ. Today, may you live looking and expecting the return of Jesus.